Do you think there'll be more than two testifying at the Uh, I was told there should be like about five or six of okay? Maybe if you're right uh, here, yeah. we have the testimony table okay. here. So I'll focus right here. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, we'll do that. Should I scoot over? Thank you. 
Dr. Ford, would you mind sharing this? Uh, I think uh, Ms. Kerr will be out for today. Oh, is, is, uh, is Ms. Kerr there? All right, never mind. <laughs> Oh great! Well, that would explain why your why your uh, children said she's not here right now. We're in our hotel room. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, Miss Kerr, I'd be happy to take roll whenever you're ready. Uh, it's very microphone is closer to you, we can't hear you. See if I can pull it over there. It was funny after I got this up. You should go to You should. Probably, yeah. Here. Is that better or should we move our table? That's, that's a lot better as long as, um, as, long as you speak up. in Carson City. Very good. The next item on the agenda, item number two, calls for public comment. Are there any members of the public who would like to comment before the approval of minutes on the march um, in Las Vegas? Anyone in Carson City? Nobody's coming to the table here. All right, and that takes care of agenda item number two. Agenda item number three, approval of the minutes of the March 21st, 2012, and the March 3rd, 2012 advisory committee meetings that were provided to the committee. And we request a vote to approve them. Anybody to uh, bring that vote? I would make a motion to approve the March 21 minutes. Do we have a second? Second. March 21 minutes are approved, and the March 30 minutes. Um, yeah. Actually, can we get uh, that was Ms. Clark up here? Um, who who made the second down there? Bill Wright. Bill Wright. Bill Wright. Bill Wright. Bill Wright. If you could please uh, state your name when you make a motion. Thank you. And the March 30, 2012 minutes. Do we have a motion to approve? Uh, Madam Chair, could we have a, a vote on the first one before we go on to the next motion? 
For the record, John Hager, um, the uh, item number four is similar to what we've seen in the past. So we're going to uh, discuss the committee calendar, the information that was provided at previous committee meetings, and the committee recommendations approved by the board. Um, we try to keep this as a summary to keep the number one to keep the committee on topic, uh, to give the committee an idea of what they've done so far and where they're going, um, and uh, and how much more work we have to do. So you'll see on the calendar, um, we'll go ahead and move on to the, the calendar on page, the uh, top of page two. Um, for the most part, we're, we're getting through a big chunk of this stuff today. Um, we hope to have final recommendations for the committee. Um, if not, uh, it's not vital that we have everything done today, but, um, but if we can get recommendations to the board for next Thursday's board meeting, that would be great. So you can see the final review status on uh, most of those items. Um, uh, we'll still need to discuss uh, premium billing, collection, and remittance requirements, and development recommended approach at future meetings. Um, but that one really requires uh, assistance from our uh, business operations solution vendor, um, which uh, we will be able to hopefully announce at the end of June or beginning of July. So, um, so that's that's why we don't have that one on topic for today. Um, at previous meetings, we discussed the, the regulations. Um, that web link there shows the SOSIO um, page for all of the regulations and guidance that have been provided by, um, by SOSIO. SOSIO is the Center for Consumer Information and Insurance Oversight, uh, which is a uh, division of CMS. Um, we provided a summary of the shop exchange in the past. I'm not going to reread this because you've, you've all seen this already. Um, the key decisions of the committee um, uh, we, during the first meeting, we, we discussed the definition of a small employer, merging the individual small group markets, employer purchasing model, and employee choice, minimum participation and contribution requirements, and the criteria for plans offered in the exchange. We're going to uh, discuss that again today. If you recall, we had that in the first meeting, um, as, as well as a few discuss a discussion of some of the key principles. Um, at that point, I didn't really understand what we meant by key principles, and, and so we were kind of getting in line with um, what the consultants were saying, at, telling us that we should we should look at. Um, and then, if you remember, on the second meeting we talked about key principles and actually passed some key principles. The board then approved those recommendations. The idea behind the key principles was to provide a uh, guidance for the committee in making its decisions. So. Um, if, if the board wanted to be business friendly, then we need to make sure that we include that in our business, uh, in our decision making process. So a little bit later on, we'll talk about the, the key principles. Um, we had a market review in the March 30th meeting. Um, it was uh, it was only fully released on March 28th. Did not give the committee a whole lot of time to review it. So um, so we provided it. Not only did we provide it in that meeting, but we also provided it again today. Uh, and the materials that we provided, uh, I believe, last week at some point. Um, so hopefully you've had enough time to to review that document. Um, and we have summary uh, summary information that's that's important to this committee and agenda item number five regarding that document. Um, we've completed included the strategic plan that has been approved so far by the board on page four. And again, the reason we do that is to align your decision making process with that of statute and the mission. Uh, vision, mission, values, and goals of the board. And then, of course, the committee recommendations approved by the board um, included the key principles that were we, that were recommended by this committee at the last meeting um, and then approved by the board at the April 12th meeting. And those key principles are to encourage participation, minimize adverse market impacts, minimize unintended market disruptions, maximize continuity of care, 
monitor, evaluate, and report routinely. Um, and no recommendations were provided at the May 10th meeting. With that, I'd be happy to take any questions regarding agenda item number four. Questions of Las Vegas? None. Any questions or questions? None here. Okay. This doesn't appear to be an action item. Therefore, no vote, right? And That's correct. Agenda item number five. Discussion and possible action regarding the small group market and shop exchange. With some points A through G, and I will have some paper discussions. So uh, for the record, John Hager, there are seven items here that are the meat of today's discussion. Uh, we need to determine whether the individual and small group markets should be merged, whether qualified health plans and the individual and shop exchange should be identical, the plan design options under different levels of actuarial value, the extent to which benefits or cost sharing may be standardized within each plan level, and, and to be clear, that's not we're not talking about essential health benefits. We're not talking about items that are covered, but uh, but the um, differences between deductibles, coinsurance, and copays, um, the employer purchasing model and employee choice, the number of plans that each insurer will be allowed to offer in the shop exchange, and the minimum contribution and participation requirements. So the the first item. Um, and, and I think what I'd like to do, if it's all right with you, Madam Chair, is go through each individual item and then have discussion on that individual item and then come back later uh, for, the, um, for the recommendations and the votes of the committee. That way the committee has the entire picture and the, and the uh, public has the entire picture before we actually make recommendations. Um, but it would be helpful to be able to ask questions when we, in that particular section. Is that all right with you, Madam Chair? Yes. So the first item is whether or not the individual and small group, small group markets should be merged. Um, so the Gorman actuarial report provided on uh, in March of 2012 um, indicated that the small group market has a higher morbidity than the individual market. If those markets were to merge, they estimate that the individual market premiums would increase 5 to 10 percent, and the small group premiums would decrease 10 to 15 percent. Uh, they also did a, a um, they reviewed what would happen if we merged the mid-size group, um, and typically we call it a large group, 51 to, to 100. Um, we write in this report that it's a mid-size group to distinguish it from large groups that are greater than 100. Um, but uh, but they also provided some information on on the mid-size group. Now uh, Nevada carriers dispute what the Gorman Actuarial Report included. We, we actually asked specifically a Gorman Actuarial um, whether, uh, uh, whether that was correct, and they indicated in their study that they, they indeed thought that the individual market had a lower morbidity rate than the small group market, that if you combine them, the individual market premiums would increase as it, as it um, basically subsidizes the small group market. Uh, individual carriers say that, that in their experience they don't think that is the case uh, because of underwriting. Um, and again, Gorman Actuarial has indicated that they included underwriting in it. Um, regardless of which direction the premiums change, it is likely that there will be a significant increase to one group or the other. Either the individual group will increase or the small group market premiums will increase. Um, and, and the reason for that is that basically the size of the populations are very similar. Um, we're looking at uh, 87,000 members, um, 58,000 subscribers in the individual market, 105,000 members, and 63,000 subscribers in the small group market. Because those populations are so close, there would likely be a significant change in one or both of those markets. Um, generally, the states that are choosing to merge the markets are, are states in which the one of those populations is only about 10% the size of the other. So that when they merge, um, you have a significant decrease in in cost for the smaller group. Either you know, if the individual group is 10 percent the size of the small group, or the small group is 10 percent the size of the of the individual market, whichever group has a small population, that group premiums would decrease, and the other population is so big that it would absorb easily absorb those changes, and so there would not be a significant increase. In the case of Nevada, because the populations are so similar, one group or the other would experience a, a significant increase 
um, in those populations. Um, if the committee and the board were to decide to recommend the mer to merge the markets, those changes would have to be endorsed by the Division of Insurance and approved by the state legislature as those, gr those groups are defined in Nevada Revised Statutes. So we'd have to submit a, uh, a, um, a bill draft request to change Nevada Revised Statute. And we would be going to the legislature um, this, uh, this winter and spring to discuss it. Uh, the decision to merge the markets affects not only those qualified health plans in the exchange, but also qualified health plans and non-qualified health plans outside the exchange. So it's a market-wide um, merging. It is not just the uh, not just the exchange. So therefore, um, staff recommendation would be that the individual and small group markets remain separate, and that the small group and mid-sized group markets remain separate until the markets are required to be combined in 2016 by the Affordable Care Act. Um, with that, I'll be happy to take any questions on the first item. John, I have a question. Um, the fifth paragraph at the top of the page describes an increase of 5 to 10% in the small group market, and the follow-up paragraph describes an increase of 5 to 10% in the three different markets that are merged. Um, is the second paragraph describe an additional 5 to 10%, or are those just similar to parallel um, options? Or? For the record, John Hager, my understanding is that those are two parallel options. Um, so it would be five to five to ten percent in either case. All right. Any other questions of And and just for clarification, um, if we merge the small group and mid-sized group markets, if we merge the two to fifty employee group and the fifty-one to one hundred employee group. That would not have any effect on the individual market as long as the individual market remains separate. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions in Las Vegas? I have a question. This is Dr. Ford. Um, could you briefly uh, review what the benefits would be to a merged market? Um, typically, the benefit to merging the market is. Um, as discussed in the, the middle large paragraph on page two at the end of that, um, it's, it's for states that have a very small, very volatile market. Um, and so, so let's say that the individual market is 10% or 5% of the size of the small group market. And, and because their group is so small, they would be very volatile. Um, the prices would swing significantly year over year. Um, because you don't have an actuarially sound group um, of people. Um, as a group gets bigger, you can create rates that are more stable um, because that larger group can absorb the um, higher one-time costs, the, um, the quadruple bypass or the blood disorder or the you know, preemie triplets. Um, if you have you know, any of those specific things, they don't happen very often, but when they happen, they really affect a small group significantly. Um, if you have a large group, then the entire group can absorb those costs, um, and, it, and it makes it much easier to absorb those costs. So, if you were to have, a, if we were a state in which one of those markets was really small, um, not only would that rate be vol more volatile, um, very often it would be more expensive. There's a reason it's small. Uh, people aren't taking that insurance for whatever reason. A lot of times it's because it's too expensive. So, if you had a small group like that. If you were to absorb them in the larger group that makes up the other 90 to 95 percent um, of that individualized small group combination, the volatility would decrease significantly. The number, the amount of the premium for that small group would decrease significantly. But because there is such a large group to absorb that, while the premium would increase uh, um, a little bit, it would be fairly insignificant, maybe a half percent, maybe a percent. So in states like that, and I think, um, and I'm not sure if it was Massachusetts or some other, there's a, there's a state or two on the East Coast where this is the case, um, they would want to merge the markets to help um, minimize some of that volatility. In the case of Nevada, because the uh, markets, the size of the markets are so similar, it would create a significant change to one market that would be, uh, one of the markets would, would certainly decrease in, um, in premium, the other market would increase in premium, and you'd want to try to avoid increasing that premium um, uh, to to whichever market um, has the lower morbidity. Sorry, I'm not reporting it. So for the state of Nevada, there is no benefit of merging markets. 
Um, in the case of Nevada, if you agree with the Gorman Actuarial Report, the benefit would be that the individual market premiums would, I'm sorry, the, the benefit would be that the small group market premiums would decrease. Um, if you don't believe that is the case, um, then you would probably think that the individual market premiums would end up decreasing. Um, so, so there would be a, a benefit to one of those populations, but it would certainly be a, um, a detractor for the other population. can't recall exactly on the report, uh, but, I, but I think it was not based, it, it was probably based on the estimated size of the populations, but not based on um, expected changes to enrollment uh, based on uh, market psychology, I guess, uh, employers dropping coverage because they're available on the, on the um, individual exchange. Um, however, you, uh, you might note that the individual market is about 80% of the small group market. And so while, while it's uh, certainly a possibility that small group employers um, drop coverage for individuals, um, then it would actually get them closer. Um, and, and so if there were, say, 40,000, um, if, if there were employers that dropped 40,000 employees from the small group market and into the individual market, that would go up, but you would see the, the statistics swap. So you would see you know, 120,000 versus 80,000. I mean, the, the markets would still be pretty similar. I don't think we'll get to the point where there's a 10% or 5% market for one, or a size of market for one group or the other. So the second question is whether the qualified health plans in the individual and shop exchange should be identical. Um, so the committee could choose to recommend that there be no difference between qualified health plans in the individual and shop exchanges. Uh, the committee could recommend that if a qualified health plan is offered in the individual, individual exchange, it must be offered in the shop exchange and vice versa. This would reduce transmission of care issues when a person moves from the shop exchange to the individual exchange as a plan the person is on while employed will be offered on the individual exchange. Uh, depending on the choice model determined by the committee and the board um, in item six, uh, an individual may or may not be able to continue on a plan if they move from the individual exchange to the shop exchange. So for instance, if, it, if an employer chooses um, a plan or a group of plans, um, and, and in, so you have an individual that that uh, has the universe of qualified health plans to select, and they select plan A, um, but the employer has not selected plan A, they selected plan C, D, and E, um, then there could still be transition of care issues going from, uh, in this case, from that person's plan A to whatever plan is offered by the employer. Um, now, the, the carriers have indicated that, that they don't think that the transition of care issues are, are significant. Um, they typically have in place um, methods to, to assist individuals that are in, in a care episode. Um, for instance, a, um, a, a, a prenatal, prenatal care typically is carried over. Um, if somebody's in some kind of issue, uh, they typically try to assist the individual in that situation <coughs> using their current providers for a given period of time, maybe 30 or 90 days. We're still working out some of those issues. Um, but uh, the, the biggest issue would be um, whether or not the person has access to the same plan and therefore the same network. So for instance, a person who is on a United Healthcare plan and the employer doesn't choose a United Healthcare plan, they'd have to move to a new plan 
could possibly do network. Now, going the other direction, um, from an employer that chooses a plan on the exchange, let's say a United Healthcare plan, and they move to the individual exchange, it is likely that that, um, that same carrier would be on there and they could keep that network. Um, if you if you make the plans identical on both sides. Um, however, uh, certain carriers prefer to offer individual policies and other carriers prefer to offer group coverage. Um, if you'll note on one of the pages in the Gorman National Report, uh, I believe Hometown Health currently does not offer individual policies, they only offer small group policies. I think another carrier um, offers individual policies but doesn't offer small group coverage or, or large group coverage. So. Um, so you'll have carriers that are comfortable in their certain, in whatever their market it is. They may have to change their business models and change the way they do business to uh, to make that work, um, or they may decide just to not play in the exchange market at all. Um, if if we create a decision that pushes carriers away from the exchange, um, then you have less competition on the exchange, and potentially uh, you increase prices. Um, Another item to consider is whether the certification criteria should be different for qualified health plans offered inside and outside the shop exchange. Staff um, has not been able to identify any specific reason to require different certification criteria. The Division of Insurance has certain licensing standards set by statute and regulation for individual and small groups. The addition of specific certification criteria uh, above and beyond that required by the license, licensing process could increase cost. A staff's recommendation is that carriers be allowed to offer qualified health plans in either or both exchanges at their discretion. Right. That Q, uh, QHPs not be required to be identical in the individual and shop exchanges. Uh, certification requirements for qualified health plans offered in the shop exchange uh, should be no different than the requirements for qualified health plans in the individual exchange. So, so what we're basically saying is allow the carriers to put a qualified health plan in either the individual exchange or the shop exchange or both depending on their business model and their business practices what they feel comfortable with um, but not to change the certification requirements for one side or the other with that i'll be happy to take any questions So you have, this is Kelly Taylor, so if you have a carrier that's choosing to participate in both individual and smaller exchanges, uh, is the question still, is there a recommendation that the plan design itself remain consistent between the two exchanges or just the network? So the disruption is more of a network disruption than a plan design with a cost share difference. I'm a little confused. The recommendation is to allow carriers to um, to place their qualified health plans in either the individual exchange or the shop exchange or both. Um, and so what that would mean is if you have a carrier that decides that they only want to offer individual coverage, that we don't require that they also put a plan in the shop exchange. In that case, if you were on the individual exchange with that carrier and you went and you ended up um, with group coverage, if you become employed and you get group coverage, then you would end up with a different carrier um, and if, um, you would end up with a different network. Now that doesn't mean that your provider won't be on that network. Um, it certainly could be, but it's very similar to what's done today. If you have individual coverage um, and you get employed, you get new insurance. Um, in today's market, um, your provider very often is, is is still a a provider on the network, but it is a different network, and, and it could end up that, that your provider is not on your employer's network. Um, going the other way, if you are employed by a uh, by an employer who offers insurance and you're going to the individual market, um, if that um, if that carrier does not provide individual coverage, um, you could either choose Cobra coverage and remain on that that uh, plan unsubsidized. Um, or you could choose another carrier that offers individual products. Um, and, and in today's market, you are not subsidized. So you would, um, if you did not choose your COBRA coverage, you could end up potentially in a carrier that does not have your provider. Um, now, one of the functions that we will have on our web portal is the ability to shop by provider and by drug type. So if you, um, if you have a specific provider that is helping you 
um, either a family care doc that you've gone to for 20 years or if you're in a specific episode of care um, and you go to a, a new carrier, you can actually um, uh, narrow down your searches based on the carriers in that network that the carrier has uh, or um, also based on the drugs that are covered by that carrier. So we're trying to create other policies that mitigate some of the issues surrounding um, whether or not your doctor is on, on that plan. Regardless of whether you go from, uh, if, well, let me back up, if a carrier offers coverage on both the individual exchange and the shop exchange, and you were to go from an individual policy to an employer policy, your deductibles would probably reset regardless of whether or not um, you're on the same, uh, with the same carrier or not, regardless of whether you're not on the same plan because it's a, a new, uh, it's basically a new policy with a new, uh, under a new um, uh, ID, if you will. Question. Um, this is Diane Ross. Um, how many carriers are there now that have, don't offer new plans, individuals, groups, large groups? I, for the record, John Hager, I think I have to look at the reports, um, but I, but I think what I saw in the survey was that there, um, in the north, I believe, Hometown Health, um, the same areas only offers um, group. So, so St. Mary's and Hometown Health offer group policies and not individual products. And I believe there's at least one carrier in the South that offers group and not individual. Um, the, the, uh, we, and, we, I'm, and I'm getting from the resident expert here um, that uh, we think Coventry is possibly one that offers group coverage and not individual coverage. Um, it probably won't be much of an issue in the South because the market is so big and most of the carriers provide both group and individual coverage. It could certainly be an issue in the North in which um, the probably the two biggest players are Hometown Health and St. Mary's when you compare them to a fairly small market um, and neither of them currently offer individual coverage. Um, I understand that, that one of them may be offering individual coverage soon, um, but, I'm not, uh, but I'm not certain of that. Uh, but it could certainly be an issue in the north where the market is significantly different from the south. What about the rules? What does fair markets look like in comparison to uh, talk about north and south? How about the rules? Is there a difference in the fair market? I can't comment on that. This is Valerie Clark. Um, the rurals generally are driven by the network that the carrier adopts or, or uh, contracts with. So uh, a lot of the rural areas are covered by the, the carriers that we've discussed today, whether they're in the north or the south. It's really based on the network of providers that they're contracted with. So it's roughly similar to, uh, I would say the rurals are very similar to the north in that regard. And Madam Chair, if I could, this is Valerie Clark again, if I could just make a statement. Um, I, I, I agree with it. I think the staff recommendation is very prudent in that. We've got two major carriers here in the north, unlike the south, that um, currently are not in the individual marketplace. Uh, I feel like there could be some disruption if there were to be requirements on those two carriers um, to comply with something that is currently not in their business model. Um, it could be quite disruptive here in the north. Do you have any more questions in the Carson City? None here. Any more questions in Las Vegas? None here. Moving on to the next item. <coughs> Item number three is a review of the plan design options under different levels of actuarial value. Um, there's no specific recommendation with this item, but um, we wanted to provide uh, kind of an idea of, of where the various actuarial values end up. Um, so we've attached the Kaiser Family Report, the patient cost sharing under the Affordable Care Act uh, in April 2012, 
and I believe this is a study based on, um, or a study by Aon Hewitt um, that looked at the bronze and silver levels, and uh, some of these items may be quite surprising. Um, for the bronze level, which is a 60% actuarial value, the deductible level at a 20% coinsurance, and 20% coinsurance is fairly typical for the market. Um, the deductible levels at uh, $4,375, um, and that, that's an estimate. Uh, different plans do have different amounts. Um, that's based on current data, so as we get closer, those numbers will change. Um, the out-of-pocket limit that they provided was $6,350, and uh, I believe that is what Aon's estimate, the out-of-pocket maximum is their estimate for what it will be for 2014. Um, currently, the the out-of-pocket limit uh, for 2013, I believe it's, it's 6200 something like that. The, um, it's basically the out-of-pocket limit is is um, pegged to the limit provided for the health savings accounts. Um, and uh, so I think this is what they're estimating the limit will be for, um, for 2014. So if you were to get a bronze level of coverage uh, with 20% coinsurance, you're looking at a $4,300 deductible. So, you're, so the individual pays of the co-pays, 100% um, of the cost for any type of labs, inpatient treatment, stuff like that, until they get to $4,300. Um, for for most people, generally, this is considered catastrophic coverage, um, even though there's another level beyond bronze, which is considered catastrophic. Um, and even in the silver level with the 20% coinsurance at a 70% actuarial value, um, you're looking at a $2,000 deductible. Um, and and uh, just as a reminder, actuarial value, the 60 or 70%, what that means is um, if you choose a silver level at a 70% actuarial value, on average, given a certain data set, um, and, and there's, a, there's a national data set that we use to make sure that the plans are, are equal, on average, the individual will pay 30% of the cost and the insurance company will pay 70% of the cost. So the insurance company has to pay that 70% of the cost um, out of the premiums that, that they charge. So um, so it's not until you get to the gold and the, and the platinum level where you actually start seeing deductible levels that are more in line with, with what people are familiar with. Um, that bronze level of coverage at $4,300, uh, you will often see that uh, for an individual um, with coverage, especially individuals when they're starting to get into their 40s, 50s, and, and 60s, um, trying to get uh, trying to pay premiums that are lower, um, they end up with deductibles that are in the four to five thousand dollar range. Um, so what that provides them, really at that point, what they're getting out of it, they get 100 percent of their wellness paid for, and they can go to the doctor for normal normal visits and things like that for for a typical copay. Uh, but the deductible level is is quite high. Um, on here, and that's basically what I wanted to uh, bring the committee's attention to. sharing may be standardized within each plan level. So this is kind of why we wanted to talk about the deductibles and co-insurance a little bit so that um, you had an idea of where we're at. Um, the Plan Certification and Management Advisory Committee, and, and that's not the shop committee, it's not a typo, it, um, it is the Plan Certification and Management Committee, could choose to recommend that all qualified health plans be offered at standard cost sharing amounts, deductibles, and co-insurance co-pays. Um, that each carrier that offered a standard QHP in a given tier could also offer a plan of their choosing in that same tier, or that no standards be set for qualified health plans other than those provided by the Affordable Care Act. The shop committee could recommend different standards for plans in the shop exchange. And, and so the, the items that are on page four and going through the top of page five are a recommendation by R.L. Carey Consulting. Um, and uh, their recommendation is that they that um, the state require carriers to provide a standard option? Um, so basically, the um, the board sets in the individual um, and the shop market a um, a set uh, deductible coinsurance copay level 
and the items that are listed are on the bottom of page four and top of page five, that the board would set those amounts um, using the standard data set that's provided by the feds, um, and that the carriers would have to hit those specific amounts, adjust their premiums as not necessary, but that they would basically be competing on um, on items like um, uh, on uh, standards of care, quality of care, um, and uh, network stuff like that. The idea behind it is that individuals have a, a better apples to apples comparison. That that the deductible is the same across the board, the copays are the same across the board, and so if you provide that standard option, it makes it easier to shop and compare for the individual or for the employer shopping for their employees. Um, the other option, if you want to make sure the carriers um, can do that, is that they um, you allow them to to provide the standard items, and then you, if they provide a standard option, they also are able to adjust these cost sharing mechanisms as they see as they see fit. Um, so basically, you would set these items before the before the insurers um, uh, start setting their plan design. Um, and we can basically follow the same review and approval process by the DOI, the same exchange schedule for submission of a qualified health plan, uh, but the board would have to be able to make these decisions prior to, um, prior to when the carriers start deciding how they're going to price it. Um, the carriers have indicated that they are opposed to the above methodology as it infringes on their ability to adjust plan design as necessary to meet their price points and would introduce unnecessary regulation that could increase costs. This could cause certain carriers to leave the market, reducing competition and potentially increasing costs. Um, the committee will need to consider the key principles approved by the board for the committee and balance the board's values to be consumer focused and business friendly. The committee might consider delaying the implementation of a standard plan to 2015 or 2016 after the exchange has some experience with enrollment and feedback from consumers. Further, it is the intent of the exchange to offer a customer service experience through the web portal <coughs> that allows for easy comparison and cost sharing plan of uh, cost sharing plan components, as well as a cost sharing calculator to allow the consumer to estimate potential costs. If the committee chooses to require that qualified health plans in the shop exchange be identical to the plans in the individual exchange, no action is required by the committee. However, if the committee may um, forward its recommendation that the plans are However, the committee may forward its recommendation to the plan certification and management advisory committee. So the staff recommendation was to allow carriers to create shop qualified health plans that meet the recommend requirements of the Affordable Care Act at their discretion. Um, so you note that um, the staff recommendation is not in line with the consultant's recommendations and, and every once in a while we disagree on things um, and every once in a while the committees disagree with the, with the staff recommendations. That's why we're here, get all the information out on the table. Um, it is our opinion that um, we are more comfortable with uh, as little disruption as possible. Obviously, um, we talked about this at the meeting on talking about the, um, uh, the key principles about minimizing disruption. Well, we're not minimizing all disruption. The, the, the idea of the Affordable Care Act is that we disrupt the market pretty severely in, that, in fact. Um, but we don't know exactly where everything is going to fall out in 2014-2015. So, so staff's recommendation is that we minimize our tweaking of the market to begin with, see where everything falls out with the Affordable Care Act, and then in a year or two after that, start tweaking if necessary and making improvements at that point um, so that we have a better understanding of, of what we're actually doing to the market. With that, I'll be happy to take any questions on item number four. Yes, actually, that was the consultant's recommendation. 
that you offer a standard plan that the board has has selected as you know the deductible coinsurance co-pays level, um, and and then if as a carrier if you are, offer a standard plan, then at that point you may also offer a plan that is not a standard plan. So that was the consultant's recommendation. Um, the concern of staff was that if you require a standard plan. The carriers may decide that they don't want any part of it to begin with and not offer their plans in the exchange. And it may not be all of them, it may only be a few of them, um, but uh, the, by, by reducing the number of, of carriers that offer coverage in the exchange, there is concern that that lo lowers competition and therefore could potentially decrease cost, which is why the staff recommended to, for at least 2014, allow basically an open market to any carrier in any plan and then in 2015 and 2016, um, perhaps we re revisit this. Um, but of course, uh, we are up for the staff's recommendation and boards um, and, and, uh, and what the board would like to do as well. So when the, the question was posed to the carriers and they didn't feel compelled to have a standard design, were they given the option of, of entering with a standard and an alternative, or were they against that option? You know, I, I, this, that conversation was about a month and a half, or two months ago, and, and every every month around here seems to take it seems like it's a year. Um, and I'm, I'm looking at DOI over there, and then he can't recall either. So I I want to say we did, but I, but I can't remember for sure. So I'm curious if they would be against a standardized plan if they had an option to also throw in an alternative or two. Um, it would seem to me that they would be agreeable to that. Um, and my, uh, my original thought would be, um, when I first got into this job, would be that if you at least offered the option of flexibility, that it would be fine. Um, but there is a lot of concern. Um, and, and if you ask any group that is being affected by the Affordable Care Act, um, there's a lot of concern about over-regulating and, and creating too many rules around it. So. Um, what I've learned is that if you're if you're in the consumer assistance um, committee, talking about um, what how you deal with navigators and brokers, there's a lot of concern for the brokerage committee. And so in this case, when you're talking about plan design and options, there's a lot of concern from the carriers. Um, and and so uh, because of that, I think that um, they are at least skeptical. Thank you, John. I've got a couple of questions. Um, if, if we were to go up here with a standard plus um, option, if you will, um, certainly the carriers can price it at, those are at, at different price points, right? And, and so if they're not really available, they could certainly price it out of the market. That's good. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so one of the, um, so certainly, so if you have, if you require a standard, a standard cost sharing plan, and then you require, and then you allow them to create whatever other plans that they might choose, um, uh, let's say for a moment, for, um, you know, scenario one is that those other options are priced out of the market. They're not competitive because they don't provide the apples to apples comparison or they, um, they cost too much, whatever, and so you end up with standard plans. The reverse scenario, option scenario two, is where the, um, the standard plans, because, you're, because we are regulating the cost sharing, um, Perhaps they are more flexible in the non-standard plans. They can offer cheaper plans on the non-standard side, and so then in that case, you cost out of the market the standard plans. That would create an issue in a subsequent year in which you have carriers that can't meet their price points for a non-standard plan because they basically been cost out of the market, and the individuals are going to the non-standard plans. Um, but if we're requiring that you that they have to provide a non-standard plan, then they're going to say, well, you know what, I'm not going to be part of this because everybody only wants the non-standard plan. So that was um, that's part of the reasoning by it, in which we, we recommend that we don't create the standard plan until a year or two down the road when we kind of understand what's going on. Or we, the other option is that we require a standard plan the first year and not require it the second year to see where we end up right? um, or revisit it later. 
There are no absolutes, and no carrier will say that any specific thing is a deal breaker because they want to be flexible enough to um, to go back on their word, I guess. Um, and not go back on their word, but to, to change what their mind, uh, I guess is a better way to say that. Um, but uh, there was, uh, this was, out of all of the things that we bring up to the carriers in our meetings, um, most items, uh, they don't have much to say. Um, when we brought this one up, this one probably had the most resistance or one of the top um, items of resistance. Um, and they were, they were more vocal about this one than most other topics we bring up with the carriers. And I'm Chair, it's Valerie Clark. Um, I think in my, in my very unofficial talks with the carriers that I work with, um, I think what John says is true. I think when regulation does create administrative cost and expense um, that somebody has to pay for, and I think the carriers feel like the more regulation that we put into some of these um, various things, um, it, it increases their time and cost and expense and could potentially drive them out of the marketplace that they're really trying to serve. So that's just my unofficial conversation with various carriers. This is Diane Ross. Um, I know this sounds pretty basic, but what's the standard plan? Is it already in place? Is it something? For the record, John Hager. So there is no standard plan. We would have to create it. So, so what happens um, right now, uh, well, not right now, but um, soon in the future, and soon depends on what the feds define as soon, so it could be a couple weeks, it could be several months. Um, basically, the feds will come up with a standard set of data that you would input into a uh, software package of some type, and you would be able to tweak all of the different co-pays, deductibles, co-insurance, things that are listed on the bottom of page four and the top of page five, and it would spit out an actuarial value, and, and basically you tweak those plan design options until you get to an actuarial value that meets the middle level that you're targeting, 60%, 70%, 80%, 90%. So right now, we expect, well, the carriers will have, will have to do this to set up their qualified health plans unless we say this is what the standard plan is. The other option is that we set a standard plan, and then they have to meet their price points based on the deductible contracts and co base levels. So um, one of the concerns that the carriers have is, you know, we'd like to be able to set a deductible level and then adjust the co-insurance and other co-pays to meet that deductible because maybe the deductible is the selling point of the market um, or maybe another copay, another carrier wants to meet uh, co-pay levels and it takes away their flexibility obviously because we are setting a, we are regulating a standard of, of these items and, and keep in mind, so there's a couple things with that um, as far as the administrative process. We would have to do this before the carrier starts setting their plan design and rates. Um, and we would have to do this every year. We have to have a set design for all four tiers, um, bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. Um, and potentially catastrophic, although I'm not sure if that's just individual or shop. I, there's too many regulations to keep in my head all at once. But that's basically the idea behind the standard plan. We would create it. John, sorry, one more question. Even though not the standard plan is what we'd like to have today, we will not be by some of the individual market. Um, certainly, consumers would do comparisons between different plans, which maybe might not be a perfect apples to apples comparison. Um, certainly, if we don't have a standard plan, then the navigators can help determine the best option on different types of plans. I mean, you see that. That's correct. Um, our intent with our, first of all, is that the web portal be as friendly as possible for the consumer. And, and we've seen examples um, of exchanges that operate today and their ability to, um, to uh, compare uh, not only premium but deductibles, co-insurance, co-pays. Um, our intent is to have a calculator on the, um, on the website. So if you were to select a plan, you could adjust um, your number of office visits, the drugs that you use, um, your specialist visits, stuff like that. And it can give you an estimate on your out-of-pocket costs. Um, and and the, the difficulty that a person will have is 
not only the, um, you know, you, you choose a plan that has a certain deductible, um, but the coinsurance is off, or um, there are some things that a person does that is subject to copay, and some things that are subject to deductible. It can be very confu confusing for a consumer, and obviously that's why we, we provide the option to have this apples to apples standard plan. Um, but, uh, but yes, the web portal is designed or will be designed to have a calculator to be able to compare um, components of that plan. And of course, we have the navigators and brokers, um, uh, and we'll be just doing that with the, in the consumer assistance meeting on um, Friday. And they are supposed to help assist the individual um, as much as possible to choose the plan that's best for that individual. is the employer purchasing model and employee choice. So the tables on page six um, basically show the options that would be available to the employee. The, the employer would have basically option D. They'd be able to see everything. And, and keep in mind, they're not seeing everything at once. Uh, we will help, um, the web portal will be designed to help narrow down the decision making process for the employer. But basically when an employer goes to the web portal, they would originally be offered the universe of small employer plans, and that would be option D. Um, so the employer sees option D, and then they whittle it down um, depending on the business rules that we select. So, so basically, we could say, um, while the employer starts with option D, he's going to choose a single plan, um, and, and this is option A that we're, we're looking at. So let's say he chooses uh, a silver plan, a specific silver qualified health plan, from carrier B. Um, his employees would not have any choice. They would get that specific plan. And that's actually very similar to how it's done today. Um, option A and option E is, um, is very typical for today's market. An employer chooses a carrier. Typically, um, they'll, they'll go to a broker. The broker will help them sign up with a specific carrier. And that, um, that carrier may allow that, that um, employer to, to either um, Either they have you know, one option, or maybe they have the option of two plans, and possibly three plans, depending on the size of the employer. Um, so, so typically in today's market, they have the universe of plans. The employer chooses a plan or a couple of plans from the carrier, and it allows the employees, um, either the employee has no choice, they get that one plan, or they have the option of choosing one or two, of, of one or two plans, and like I said, sometimes three. In the exchange, um, we have the potential to doing this several different ways. Um, you could go with option B. So the employer says, you know what, I want to provide my employees with a specific level of cost sharing, say a silver plan or a gold plan. Um, so let's say they choose, choose a gold plan. Um, the carrier or the, to the employee would be allowed to choose any plan that's a gold plan, or in this case, an option B, the example here. The employee would be able to choose any small business plan, small employer shop plan that is in the silver category. Um, the other option is that we can tell the employer, you know what, you can choose any carrier that you want, um, but not any metal tier. And so um, option C, you see the, the employer looks at all the items, the universe of plans, he, the universe of carriers, he selects one carrier and the um, and the employees could choose any plan that um, is offered in the shop exchange by that carrier. Um, in option D, we say, um, you know what, the employer has no choice about it. If you offer coverage on the exchange, your, your only choice as an employer is to offer coverage on the exchange or off of the exchange. And if you offer coverage on the exchange, your employees can choose any plan. Now this is the most consumer friendly, this is the most employee friendly the employees can choose anything that they want. <clears throat> so they can choose one with very, very rich um, plan sharing, cost sharing on the platinum plan, or they can choose a plan that's very lean and very inexpensive on the bronze side. They can choose carrier A that has this network or carrier D that has you know, another network with different providers. Um, option E, options E and F are provided um, to kind of show what we do today, um, as well as option A. Um, so option E is one carrier, one package, and then the idea behind option F is to allow a partnership for carriers. Um, and, and so 
you might have a situation um, in which a carrier is, is regional. Um, they offer only coverage in the north or only coverage in the south. Uh, this would allow, but you have an employer who has employees in both Las Vegas and Reno. This would allow an employ, a carrier to partner with uh, with carrier in the opposite um, geographical area and and uh, be able to get um, coverage or get um, market share from those employers. So so basically, options E and F are very similar to what is done today. Although I think the idea of partnerships doesn't happen that often. Um, they, people will, uh, employers will typically take a plan that's offered in both the north and the south. The idea behind this one is that it would um, be able to increase competition by allowing smaller groups to um, to enter the market on a statewide basis. So the problem with option D is the potential for adverse selection. Um, and, and actually it, it's, it's a problem with option C as well. Um, if you are an individual that has higher medical expenses, higher out-of-pocket costs, you will likely pay a higher premium so that you can um, get a, a, um, a smaller out-of-pocket cost on the back end, um, a, a more level out-of-pocket cost. And if you are an individual, and this is typically people in their 20s and 30s that don't go to the doctor very often, they are more likely to pick a plan that is, more clo that is closer to the catastrophic level silver or bronze plan. They're not likely to go to the doctor. They just need some wellness and need to go to the doctor every now and then. So they'll pick a plan that, that is less expensive on the premium side but more expensive if they actually have to go to the hospital. Um, so when you have that, you enter a um, situation where you'll have adverse selection um, and typically higher costs. Um, if you narrow it down to one carrier, uh, a carrier may be able to um, to do things that minimizes some of the adverse selection, and at the very minimum, that carrier uh, will be able to contain that selection within their one plan. If you open it up to the universe of plans, there would be concern with carriers that um, one carrier may end up with all the healthy people in the bronze level, and they would end up with all of the unhealthy people uh, at the platinum level and end up getting priced out of the market. Um, so there's a certain um, several different ways to look at it. Um, one of the questions we'll, we'll, and we'll talk about, and I'm going to go ahead and talk, touch on this briefly, are uh, contribution and participation requirements. Um, <clears throat> typically, uh, there is a set level of um, there is a set level of uh, contribution or con uh, participation requirements. So, so if an employer wants to get coverage for his employees, typically he has to pay say 50% of the cost or 75% of the cost. Um, and uh, many carriers also require a certain level of participation so that they don't get all the unhealthy folks in their group and, and none of the healthy folks. Um, and that's also a way to, to minimize or mitigate the adverse selection risks. Um, in any of these options where there are multiple carriers, we will have to come up with a method to set a minimum contribution or participation rate, which we'll discuss a little bit later. Um, if you have only one carrier or a package, uh, you could let the carrier determine that contribution rate. Um, so again, the more choice you have, the more potential for adverse selection. The less choice that the employee has, the less potential for adverse selection. So it's a matter of balancing <laughs> the employee choice with, um, with the uh, the risk of adverse selection, the risk of increasing premiums and, and pricing people out of the market, and potentially pricing carriers out of the market, which could increase, which could decrease competition and potentially increase cost. Um, so the staff's recommendation, um, and so I'm not going to read everything specifically, but I think that pretty much covers what we we got here. <clears throat> staff's recommendation is a combination of items of options B, E, and F. So um, what we would do um, is say that as a, an employer, you could either choose for your employees um, a tier, an open metal tier. So you choose a silver plan or you choose a platinum plan. Um, but across the board, the employees get the same cost sharing. They can choose whatever carrier um, decides to offer a plan in an open metal tier. And um, and so that would allow the employee to choose their network, to choose 
um, the carrier that they, that they prefer. Um, and then the other option for the employer would be to allow them to offer a package similar to what's done today. Um, the idea behind that is the employer has a better um, handle on their cost sharing and what they're going to, to pay. So they would set a, let's say they set the cost sharing at 50% of whatever the silver plan is, or let's say the, um, let's say the carrier offers a gold and platinum plan for that package, so that the employer can say, I want to offer, um, I want to pay for 50% of the gold plan, and then if my employees decide to buy up, they can buy up the platinum plan, but that increase in cost would be on the employee. Um, so in the example we have in item E, the, um, the employer would say, all right, we're going to offer a package. This is a package that's offered by carrier B. You can either choose the silver plan or the gold plan, and I will pay for 50% of the silver, of the cost of the silver plan. Um, if you want to, as an employee, purchase the gold plan, you can, but you pay for 100% increase in cost. Um, now, uh, it becomes a little more complicated than just saying 50% of the silver cost because the costs are different depending on your age. You can still, um, the carriers can still rate based on your age and your smoking status. So <coughs> the employer, much like they do today, would provide a, um, a demographic report on its employees. Um, you got your employee, their address, uh, their age, um, their, um, their dependents, um, and their whether they smoke or don't smoke. And today, I think that there might be more in that um, report, but it will be limited to those factors. Um, and then, uh, basically, the employer is required to, to pay a certain percentage of whatever the employee's cost is at whatever age that they're at. Um, so the web portal will be able to calculate what their premium would be, what their 50% level on that silver plan would be, and would be able to determine um, how they buy up. Um, the same thing would basically be done uh, if you if the employer chose a metal tier, um, uh, but it would make it uh, a little more difficult for the employer to, to figure out how much their cost would be. I don't know um, yet if, if it would be 50% of any of the silver plans that are offered or if it would be 50% um, of a specific plan and they can buy up or down depending on the carrier. Um, maybe it would be 50% of the lowest cost plan. Um, but, uh, and, and that 50%, it could be 75%, it could be 60%. Um, we need to determine on, on a later um, option, a later item, um, what that level should be, at least at a minimum. Um, the employer could choose to offer a higher um, contribution rate. Um, so again, the idea, the, the recommendation is that we offer to the employer the ability to choose either an open metal tier plan or a package. And if they choose an open metal tier plan, what, what tier that they would choose, then their employees would see um, all the items and all the plans offered in the silver plan. Um, if the employer chose a package, um, then their, uh, their employees would see something like you see in items E or F. And, um, the employee would have a, cho a choice to make, again, very similar to what's done today. Um, a package could be a single plan as well. So it would be up to the carrier to decide if a specific product, a specific qualified health plan is, <coughs> is going to be offered in a package or in an open metal tier or both. Um, and, uh, and so the, the idea would be, um, you disrupt the market as little as possible by offering these packages, uh, but then you also option a, uh, you also offer another option for competition with the carriers, allowing them to offer qualified health plans that are in an open metal tier, and um, so that the competition would be on the employee level in that case on what plan that they would choose. Um, I hope that makes sense. That's a it's a lot of talk for. Um, I guess it's it's. Not a very, it's not a simple con, um, con concept. Although I, I think we should, by providing the diagrams, I think that helps a little bit. Uh, but I'll be happy to take any questions that you have. Uh, this is Doug Ford. Um, simple question about the option B, the open metal 
volunteer. Uh, are, the, are the small businesses uh, directly paying the insurers or are they paying through the exchange? My concern is, is having four or five or six different insurers that they have to do business with would be uh, an adverse issue for the small businesses. Yes. That, that would certainly be a concern. Um, one of the requirements of the exchange, the, afford, the uh, Affordable Care Act requirements, is that there's a premium aggregator um, so that basically the employer would only deal, deal with the exchange as far as paying premiums. Um, we would uh, collect the premiums from the carrier, uh, or no, I'm sorry, we collect the premiums from the employer um, and we, uh, they would remit to us um, the premiums for the individual. Now, the individual side, uh, the individual employee side, uh, it can be done in several different ways, but basically this, these, the subsidized piece that are, that's provided by the employer would come to the exchange, we would aggregate it, and then send it out to the individual carriers. So they would not have to send um, payments to six different carriers. Uh, on the employee side, it gets a little more complicated. When you talk about um, individuals that have uh, lower income, that perhaps have have a, uh, a disabled uh, spouse that's in Medicaid and two children that are in CHIP, and, and how you aggregate those payments, uh, we're still working on that. Um, there is the potential to be able to collect it from a, a pre-tax deduction from an individual's pay, um, or there's a potential to bill the family um, and and uh, collect it um, separately from uh, the exchange we collect it to the, to the uh, carrier um, or the carrier could bill. Um, we're working through those details. We need to see what the capabilities will be of the, um, the business operation solution vendor that we select. Uh, Madam Chair, this is Valerie Clark. Um, I, I agree with most of the things that John said earlier. The only uh, thing I would have trouble with is currently in the small group marketplace, most carriers, not all, but most carriers are set up and offering plans very similar to option C. Uh, if, if we do not include an option C in there, and, and what option C does is it provides maximum flexibility to an employer who struggles with cost. So if you're actually looking at 50% of two options, uh, for instance, in option E, you're limiting an employer's flexibility um, greatly in, in terms of cost, whereas option C, there is much more flexibility for an employer. Um, I would definitely recommend that an option C be included, and if not an option C, then an option E that has one more option, uh, a minimum of three, uh, is what I'm seeing in the small group marketplace right now. And the carriers are, taking into account the potential for adverse selection and are able to rate accordingly. So my recommendation would be option C. For the record, John Hager. Um, so just so that I understand, when, a, when an employer goes to a carrier through the broker, does the carrier offer every plan that they have or does the carrier offer a set of plans, you know, three plans, four plans, but not all of their plans necessarily? Valerie Clark, yes. They usually have a a package of plans that can be offered in its entirety or an employer can pare down to three or four different options. It is very, very rare that I sell less than three options to a small employer now, where at, and, and, and most of the time it's at the, uh, the carrier requires that 50% of the lowest price plan is what the employer pays in order to keep that, to get that plan up and running. Um, but it is rare, very rare nowadays that I go under three plan options within a package that is offered by a carrier. For the record, John Hager, so the intent of option E was not to limit it to two. It was diagrammed that way so that it was clearly different from offering the universe of plans from a specific carrier. The, the, the idea for option E was to allow the carrier to decide how many plans should be in any specific package. So, so the carrier could say, I want only one plan in the package or I want five plans in a specific package. Um, there could be, depending on if we make any limits, there could be multiple plans in a specific tier, or there could just be one plan, they could have all four tiers covered. It's up to the carrier to decide how they want to compete in the market. Okay, Valerie Clark, so 
as long as a carrier does have the ability to offer a variety of plans with a variety of premium dollars that's not limited to just two, then I would be okay with that. Right, and so the recommendation was to allow the carrier to offer a package option um, with as many plans in that package as they want to certify. Valerie Carp, so the thing I'm concerned about is that when you're looking at these various um, metals, um, we, uh, that's where I see range of cost. So if the range of cost is not maximized such as an option C, but rather is minimized such an option E, then that that's where employers are going to have a hard time financially. Sure, and, and so another option, um, the carrier could offer a platinum plan and a bronze plan and nothing in between. Or they could offer uh, a platinum, a silver, and a bronze plan. There are any number of uh, ways they could do it. It would be up to the carrier to make their packages marketable.
suppose we could all huddle around my phone and <laughs> call it their calling number. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yesterday afternoon we had problems too. Okay. Northern cars and yeah. electricity all around. Some of these uh, <coughs> these models where the employer where the employees go in and they can choose different carriers and that will change how so you, you could have um, fifty and another employee's twenty five and it would be rated probably you know, you price a lot of carriers to rate based on age if it's different carriers. Yeah, well they would rate on age. age. They would rate on age, so then the fifty percent is of whatever that premium is based on their age, which is Right now, on the plus side, the, the premium aggregator would, would calculate what that person is based on the lowest cost plan or something like that. Um, but yeah, that's different from a policy perspective. Why do we want individuals at different ages with a small employer to be paying different premium amounts? Different, different employees at different ages within a small employer pay different amounts because of the differences in age. That's not but you have to. That's not how it's done currently. Right, but you have to do that because of non-discrimination rules. It has to be 50% of whatever the premium is. We, you don't have to vary. You don't have to vary <coughs> the amount that you pay. Uh, but it's the age have. you could, you could, if it's a, if it is a single carrier like it is today, they're, they're yeah, with that composite rate. So you I don't think you can do composite rates though anymore. Yeah, you need to The exchange can do composite rates? I don't see why not. So it's no, administratively we're not going to do that do because well, so 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 well, we're saying we're saying that, that you're going to have different rates for every employer. This would be this would be a so really obviously you know way down. Right? Yes, there's <laughs> a really positive <laughs> aspect to age rating, but it becomes in a group marketplace it becomes really tedious to deal with age rating when you have you know during ages and a defined contribution. Of, or, or defined benefit, or defined, you're saying 50% of the lowest price plan. So a 65 year old. Yeah. The employer pay more for a 65 year old. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. And you can see how that could start to shift an employer's motivation when it comes to hiring. Yeah. Age rating is tedious. I believe in age rating. I like it. I prefer age rating. But it's really, really tough to do. This in an age rated scenario. Um, well, so so in the age rated scenario, the, the provide the carrier provides rates for the key ages that they have, and we put them into our system, and then the employer selects the plan and you know chooses the parameters, and it and it is what it is, and it's all done on that. <coughs> It's, there's a lot to work out. Yeah. yeah. Do Do we have their number? We can just um, I can put my phone on speakerphone and we can all huddle around. The phone number to that room. Yeah. I don't know that that room has a phone in there. <laughs> what was What was the number? I mean, did we dial a number or is that an no, IP? No, it's teleconference tier. It, it, so it's an IP address or is it a phone number that oh, they yeah. had to call to get to that? Line. Just the eight hundred. The phones are down in the building also. I know, but I got a cell the phone system. <coughs> yes, but my cell phone is available. I can put it on a speakerphone and call them. Do they have a phone number? I'm not sure about that location. 
Let me see. We're going to make a phone call. I'm going to see if they have it. Anybody has an iPad. Oh, we're not. We don't have Wi-Fi. I was going to do FaceTime, but not without Wi-Fi. Right. But, but if there's a... Could be? Could be? Could be? Could be? I know, I know, but they would have to use the call intro too. Yeah, well, so I wanted to be able to do their speaker, their, their major circle of speakers. Let me see. Mm -hmm. Okay, is there a phone in there? Is there a phone in that room? Yeah, if you don't mind, they would require the phone is going to get put to the top of the chair. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and do this. Okay. 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 Okay.
Okay, what's your number, sir? 775. 771. 671. 4299. Hey, Dr. Ford. Yeah, they're, they're going to try calling me on, on whatever line they've got there. Okay. Uh, yes. All right. Bye. All right. Thank you. Okay. So you made that number to them. Are they dialing it? Phone uh, Is there a phone number? There's a phone number, but they don't have a number. So that's why. So they're dialing here. This is John Hager. Good. Let me try and put you on speakerphone. Okay. Can you hear us? Yes. Yeah, can hear you. Can you hear us? Yes. Um, we're going to have to all speak very loudly. Can you hear me? Can you still hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. So, uh, Madam Chair, are you ready to, to continue? Oh, oh no. One of those days. <laughs> Did they call you from the phone in the room? Yeah. And then you lost? <coughs> yeah. I think that was on their end because I'm getting all five bars. Okay. Hello. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Let me yeah, let me talk to her. Hi. Yes. I agree. Yeah, yeah, we'll do that. I think um, the next meeting, let's see what we've got for the next meeting is scheduled. Um, is it? Let's see here. So the next meeting is scheduled for June 26th. So that's that's only three weeks away. So that, I think that'll, that'll be fine. Okay. <clears throat>
yeah we'll do that. so yeah, june twenty tuesday, june twenty sixth at nine thirty.